right, so we're going to get started for the first question. What about Adam, Dr. Craig? What What do we do with Adam? Was he a real Was he a real person, and why do you think that matters? Well, there are basically four views concerning the historical Adam. The first view we could call the traditional view. This is the view that the church has held uh, down through history, that Adam and Eve were a real historical couple who lived just a few thousand years ago, uh, were created by God out of the dust of the earth, um, and uh, were the ancestors of all of mankind. A second view would say that uh, Adam and Eve were not the universal ancestors of mankind, though they were a real historical couple that lived um, relatively recently, a few thousand years ago. This view holds that what God did was select out of a wider human population outside the garden, one specific couple to set his favor upon and then to bless their descendants. And so Adam and Eve are real historical people who are the descendants of uh, a certain subclass of the human beings that have lived on this uh, earth. A third view would say that Adam and Eve were real historical persons, but that they were extremely ancient. They lived perhaps hundreds of thousands of years ago, and they were, in fact, the universal uh, common ancestors of all humankind. Every human being who has ever walked upon the face of the earth is descended from Adam and Eve. And this universal descent is purchased by pushing the location of Adam and Eve very, very far into the ancient past. And then finally, a fourth view we could call the mythical view, which would say that Adam and Eve were not historical persons, that this is uh, simply a Hebrew a myth about the creation of humanity and how every person is uh, mortal, uh, sinful, fallen, and in need of God's grace and forgiveness. Adam is every man, as it were, uh, and therefore we shouldn't be looking for a time and place in history where he actually lived. Now, within those four broad categories, there are many different alternatives, but I think that pretty much sums up the broad um, survey of the options. So which one of those options would you consider the, the, the one that the church has held the longest? The traditional oh, view? Oh, clearly the traditional view has been held the longest. It's only really been with the advent of modern science and the discovery that humankind did not originate a mere 10,000 years ago, but uh, far, far into the past as we've discovered not only the remains of human beings going much further back, but also their artifacts, things like the beautiful cave paintings in uh, Lascaux and Chauvet, France, uh, and archaeological discoveries of uh, arrowheads and spears and beads and uh, grindstones and all sorts of other implements used by uh, ancient man. Uh, it, it's challenged this traditional view of Adam and Eve. Also, the discovery of population genetics, that the genetic um, diversification among human beings today is too great to have arisen from a single couple just a few thousand years ago. In order for the um, diverse human genetic profile to have arisen from a single couple, they must have lived hundreds of thousands of years ago. So it's been in virtue of these modern archeological and paleontological and historical and genetic discoveries that the traditional view uh, has now been severely challenged. So, so I've been aware of your work for a long time. I, I mean, I got started with with following your work on the Kalam cosmological argument. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've gone from from cosmological argument to even just recently thinking about uh, Platonism. Why why all of a sudden have you are you dealing with this historical Adam question? 
this is really uh, out of the box for me. And the reason is simply this, Matthew, I am engaged in writing a systematic philosophical theology. And in order to do that, I had to bone up on areas where I felt I was weak. One of those areas was the doctrine of the atonement. And so I spent two years studying the doctrine of the atonement. Another area was the doctrine of man or theological anthropology. I was very confused and uncertain as to what to think about the historical Adam. And so I embarked upon, again, a two-year study of the question of the historicity of Adam, both from a biblical point of view and also from a modern scientific point of view. And that's how I came to be studying this question. So what, what did you find was the most surprising as you started researching? Boy. Um, I mean, because you're a man of many letters. I mean, you have two doctorates. Yeah. I mean, you, when it comes to somebody like me, I mean, I mean, I know nobody can have exhaustive knowledge, but I would think yeah. not many things surprise you. I mean, is there something that of note okay. as you were looking at the doctrine of man? That yes, there there would be a couple of things. Biblically speaking, I think what really surprised me was the plausibility of analyzing the literary genre or type of Genesis chapters one to eleven as something called mytho history. Uh, this is a term that was coined by the great Assyriologist. Uh, uh, Torkild Jakobsen, uh, and it characterizes a narrative that does concern actual historical events, but which are told in the figurative language of myth. And I think there are very persuasive reasons to think that Genesis 1 to 11 belongs to this genre of mytho-history, and that therefore it's a mistake to take it as uh, a literalistic historical narrative. Now, lest any of your viewers be upset by that, let me remind them that that's what everybody believes about the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible. It is filled with symbols of uh, beasts and dragons and things of that sort that are not to be taken literally, but represent nation states and uh, alliances, political alliances and so forth. Nobody thinks that the beast is some sort of a creature like in Beauty and the Beast. Uh, rather, this is a person who is opposed to God and is a political uh, and military figure. So I would simply ask people to be open-minded about considering whether or not, just as we take the last book in the Bible to be symbolic and imagistic, whether or not that might not also be a way of plausibly interpreting the first 11 chapters of the first book of the Bible. Now, the other thing that surprised me, Matthew, scientifically was I was really stunned by the compelling archaeological evidence concerning how early modern cognitive behavior is exhibited among archaic human beings. Um, there have been spears discovered in Germany that are as carefully crafted as modern Olympic javelins are. And these date from around 400,000 years ago and were used uh, doubtlessly in big game hunting. Uh, moreover, in France, in Brunichel Cave, there was found uh, a construction, a circular construction of stalagmites um, that were put inside of this cave by Neanderthal men. Uh, it dates back to uh, around 176,000 years ago or so, uh, before modern Homo sapiens came into Europe. And then there was also discovered very recently within the last year, a piece of three-ply braided Neanderthal string where these Neanderthal men had actually taken fibers and twisted them into string to make into cords. And the archaeologists on this find said that this required mathematical intelligence that would be comparable to what would be required by a modern language user. 
And I think that just makes it completely implausible to deny the full humanity of these ancient human beings. So I'll get to, let me ask you this. So is how do we integrate like these archaeological and the scientific evidence? How, how if I'm talking to a pastor or helping a pastor yeah. think through this issue, I mean, this is a convoluted complex issue. Oh, it is. Think. And for somebody it like is. you trying to, to move through it, it's even more difficult for pastors, not because they can't oh. handle it, because they don't have the time and all these other exactly. issues. Exactly. I've mean, spent how, years on this. Yes. Well, let me try to summarize my conclusions rather than how I got there. Okay. Um, I think that the best way to coordinate the scientific and biblical data is to, is to push Adam and Eve way back into the past so that they are the ancestors, not only of Homo sapiens, but also of Neanderthals. Um, and that puts them back around 750,000 years ago. If we locate Adam and Eve there, there's no problem with their being the ancestors of every human being that has ever lived. And they are also far enough in the past that all of the genetic diversification among the present population can arise from a single couple who lived more than 500,000 years ago. So what this would require you to revise in the traditional view would be the recency of Adam and Eve. It would require you to give up their recency uh, and adopt uh, uh, an ancient view. But once you do that, the rest of the narrative is unaffected. Uh, they will be the progenitors of every human being that ever existed. You can have a historical fall. Um, it's only the date that I think needs revision. So uh, by way of uh, my final conclusion, who was the ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals? Well, it was a hominin called Heidelberg Man. Uh, and you can look him up on Wikipedia if you want to, to read more about Heidelberg Man. Um, but I think that he was probably Adam and Eve, or Adam and Eve were, did belong to the uh, species Heidelberg Man. Uh, and he was not some kind of an ape man or something like that. He was an intelligent, um, gifted and cognitively modern human being, uh, which is ancestral to Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So two more questions. In your research, if I had to play devil's advocate here, it, it, within the church, I could see somebody asking me, but Jesus referred to Adam almost as a real person. Is there, yes. did you know, how did Second Temple Jewish culture view Adam or even Paul? I mean, uh, I think they almost universally took him to be a historical person. Uh, when you read the extra biblical Jewish literature from that time, they often refer to Adam. And though they exploit him theologically for different purposes, they all assume he was a real person that actually lived. So did Jesus of Nazareth, and so did the Apostle Paul. And so I think it's important to safeguard the historicity of Adam and Eve. What I, I change in the traditional view is not their historicity, just the date at which they lived. That's good. Well, what about these other views? And this would be my last question. I mean, I, we could go okay. for hours on this. At least I could. But I think this is an important question because maybe you can help me out. It, the church has to be large enough to to hold all these. Let's just call them the four views you talked about, right? I mean, I mean, do you think? I mean, how do we as Christians deal with so many different theories of of interpretation and with tolerance and care within the church? Because this is a this is a big issue that has a lot of potential for disunity within the church. Uh, do you it agree? really, really does. And so I think here we need to have uh, charity in doctrines that are not essential to the Christian faith. We're not talking here about the incarnation or the Trinity or the uh, vicarious atonement of Christ or the resurrection. We're talking about when did Adam and Eve live? And I think that the church is big enough and broad-minded enough to embrace a big tent, or, uh, to be a big tent and embrace a diversity of views. And I, I have to say, honestly, Matthew, that I have been shocked at how open Christian lay people are to the position that I've just laid out briefly here. I, I thought I would get all kinds of 
hate mail and hostility and resistance. But I find Christian laymen are, are pretty open-minded about this. Yeah, I mean, well, I think churches as a whole are looking for ways to make sense of uh, hold the hold scripture high and make sense of discoveries that we're having in archaeology and in science and in other disciplines. Well, absolutely. For the sake of our young people, for our high schoolers, middle schools, schoolers, we have got to be able to address this issue in a credible way yeah, or they're going to walk away from their faith. Totally agree. And we have to be open and honest and follow truth. And, and I'm always telling I, I taught classical school for years. And I'd always tell my seniors, uh, one senior class specifically, I said, I want you to be curious. I want you to go out and n understand that God's world is big enough uh, and just go, not, not just test it, but I just think it's the only worldview that we have going on. It is the only truth. And people like you and the resources that yeah. you have at Reasonable Faith, uh, it's just, for me, it's vital for pastors and churches today. Um, yes. Could I, could I just underline what you sure. just said, Matthew? It's so important that your viewers understand that there are good reasons to think that the Christian faith is true. There are good mm -hmm. arguments for the existence of God and powerful evidence for the person of Jesus. So we're not asking you to make a sacrifice of your intellect or a leap of faith in the dark. Uh, there are good reasons, convincing reasons for being a Christian. And that's what your work has done. Um, Reasonablefaith.org, you have a defenders class where you have at Johnson's Ferry, you have uh, recorded your Sunday school. I, man, that is a go-to for me. I'm Good. just now starting the atonement part of it. It is so fulfilling. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this work that you're doing on Adam, when do you, do you have any idea of when that will be out? I recently saw that Erdman's, the publisher, put up uh, an Amazon page for pre-ordering it, and they're saying in the in September of next year. I, I was disappointed to see that it's so far off, but at least that's the projection at present, September. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, you're you're in Georgia, next door to Alabama, but you know, just know <laughs> that in Alabama, I'm pushing your work a lot. I think oh. so much for you, and especially your wife, because it's a couple. You know, my wife, if it wasn't for my wife, my ministry wouldn't be here. And so I acknowledge that oh. you're, you and your wife sacrificing and doing what you've done for so many years. Uh, you, it, it's, it's actually being fruitful and helpful uh, in my work and so many other people. So thank you for so, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, certainly it's a joy.